only thing I'm going to show here, um, I believe it's on campus. So last time uh, we were <coughs> talking about programming in FPGAs. JTAG uh, in its original context uh, a little bit later on. But what I want to discuss now is how it's used for FPGA programming. <clears throat> JTAG was originally developed as a means of testing boards and integrated circuits. And it was shortly thereafter that people said, hey, I can use this to program FPGAs. So there's this <clears throat> document on campus, Configuration of Readback of Vertex FPGAs using the JTAG Boundary Scan. Boundary Scan is something we're going to talk about in a future lecture. Um, JTAG stands for the uh, Joint Test uh, Analysis Group. This was a consortium of companies that got together. and said, we need to come up with some standard we'll agree on, a protocol for testing boards and stuff like that. Uh, and it ultimately developed into an IEEE standard. In this case, it's IEEE standard 1149.1. .1. <coughs> future lecture we're going to be looking at the architecture required inside the chip to support JTAG. Uh, this shows on this FPGA four pins that are associated with JTAG, but there's internal resources in there also required, and we'll take a look at those uh, later. One of the resources inside a chip that can work with JTAG is something called the test access port or TAPS controller. <clears throat> and we're going to be taking a look at uh, that controller circuit JTAG has a number of different inputs and output pins. Um, these four, TDI, TDO, TMS, and test clock are mandatory. You have to have those. So you can get by with as little as four different lines uh, on JTAG. The data that <clears throat> JTAG is going to work with is serial data. So you have TDI, test data input, TDO, test data output, test mode select, and a clock. 
and these are uh, described down here below. Now, the, the test access port controller, the tap circuit grid, is actually a 16 state more finite state machine. And there is the uh, state diagram. Test mode select, that one bit, that's what that is. It's the input to your finance station, TMS. Now this has a unique way, somewhat clever way, of getting into the initial state. Now normally on a finite state machine, your initial state is forced into the finite state machine before you apply any inputs by typically asserting presets or clears to get you into that initial state. Here, they don't do that. What they do here is, you set test mode select, the input, equal to a logic one, and clock it five times. And you'll be in your initial state. Now, when I power this thing up, I could be in any state. I could be in that state. Test mode select is one, five clocks. First clock. Second clock. Third clock. Fourth clock. Doesn't matter what state you start in. Test mode select is the logic one. Five clocks. We're going to be in test logic reset the initial state. So this is kind of a unique way of getting finite state machine into the initial state, as opposed to asserting presets and clears, which would be the normal way that you would do that. Okay. So what I want to do. is go through those steps and see which states I would visit in the finite state machine state diagram. So, uh, this incidentally is a configuration sequence. This is the sequence of steps that you would go through to program an FPGA. So on power up, place a one on test mode select and 
clock, T clock, five times. So it shows you over here what TDI, test data input, would be set equal to, what test mode select would be equal to, and the number of clocks. So it doesn't matter what test data in is, test mode select is one, five clocks. And that gets you into the initial state, test logic reason. Second step. You want to move into the RTI state, which says that I put a zero on test mode select and give it one clock. Zero, one clock, and then run test item, RTI. Move into the select IR state. Test mode select is one, two clocks. Of one, one clock, two clocks, I'm in select IR scale. So you see how this uh, procedure is working. It, it's telling you which states that you're actually going to. Now, you can follow this all the way through. Um, I want to draw your attention down here to step eight. Uh, you were in the select DR state, you want to go to the shift DR state, so you put a test mode select as one and two clocks. Select DR. Go oh, enter the shift DR state. So I'm in select the arm. Oh, logic one, there's one clock, second clock. Enter the select DR state. So after step seven, I'm in this state. Enter the shift DR state. This appears to be in this. Oh, a zero and two clocks. Zero, another zero, I'm in the shift DR state. Now look at step nine. In step nine, you shift in that configuration sequence. Now remember we said that's a binary string, maybe megabits long. So on test data in, you would start to have the configuration data coming in. Test mode select is zero. As long as you're in shift data and you have a zero input, you stay in that state. How many clocks do you give? Number of bits in the bit string minus one. And then uh, step 10 is for the last bit in the bit string. And then there's uh, a few other steps uh, beyond that. But this shows you how JTAG is used to actually bring in the uh, configuration sequence to program the FPGA and ultimately program that flash memory chip. Uh, as a side note, we said that the JTAG interface had a mandatory four pins. Test that in, test that out, test mode select and test clock. This typically will go to uh, the computer through the USB port, where the file is, it's got your configuration information. The USB interface is a four-wire interface. So it works uh, quite well.
In fact, there's a special cable uh, that's used for this purpose. Uh, this is the, uh, the spacing so that you can slide that over four pins on your printing circuit board. If you have uh, this type of connector on your printed circuit board, that would slip onto that. And the other end is the standard USB port connector. So there are special purpose cables that you can buy uh, to facilitate this. These cables are real cheap, they're like 20, 25 bucks, something like that. Okay. So now, Important thing is, they tell you what is required not how to do it. Specification only says you need to come up with a system that has the following capabilities. Uh, now, it may turn out that to implement that, you're going to need finite state machines, counter circuits, um, microprocessors, uh, 6.4 gig of memory, but you as a designer have to determine that. Specification is not going to tell you that. It's going to state what the capabilities of the system uh, are. Now, there's a variety of different types of specifications. There's the system spec. Um, there's a hardware spec, and we're going to assume this is for some microprocessor-based product, so you will have a software spec. Uh, I have a documentation spec, and I'm going to put an asterisk there. testing spec. Um, and the asterisk is maybe part of other specs. <clears throat> this depends on uh, and I'm going to put an asterisk here for the same reason. Uh, it depends on the company and which way they want to do this. In some companies, the documentation that's going to be required and the testing of the hardware and the software will be incorporated into these specifications rather than a separate document. Uh, the information is still there. It's just whatever the company, uh, whatever the company likes to operate in, will determine whether these are separate documents or incorporated in some of these. Now, the hardware and software uh, 
uh, specs are kind of intuitively obvious for our microprocessor based product. Uh, the system spec is something that you may not be that familiar with. And if you were going to do a tree diagram, you'd have the system spec, and out of those would come the hardware spec and the software spec. So the question is, well, what goes in there? The system spec is going to tell you the requirements of the system uh, at the system level. And let me give you an example to illustrate that. Uh, let's suppose, make it simple. Let's suppose uh, we've got a personal computer down here. Let's suppose that we're going to come up with a new personal computer. So what would go in the system spec? Well, this particular desktop computer here runs off of 115 volts AC. Doesn't run off of 24 volts DC. Doesn't run off of batteries. It runs off 115 volts AC. The system spec would specify the size of the screen. Um, whatever size this is, 19 inch or whatever. It would specify what type of user and I.O. you've got. Keyboard, maybe a trackpad, joystick, uh, et cetera. Uh, system spec would tell you what the Bluetooth capability is so that you could interface uh, a microphone or headphones or, or something like that. Um, it would specify whether or not there's a Wi-Fi capability. Yeah. So, like, where does the um, like software packaging like separate from like for like well, I'm Bluetooth? Well, I'm going to get to. Okay. Uh, get to them. So these are all system level um, requirements that this product is going to have to have. Now, from the system spec, you can then derive your hardware and your software spec. Um, the hardware spec may state what kind of processor you're going to use, how many bits of data or data transfers, this is 16-bit, 32-bit, etc. Hardware spec may uh, specify based on these uh, system spec requirements uh, how much memory you have to have, the mixture of memory that you have to have, how much RAM, how much uh, flash memory, and so forth. Uh, the system spec may specify an operating system, uh, may specify what language application software will be written in. So now you come to the software spec, and in the software spec, they're going to uh, provide more uh, detailed information on uh, how the software is actually supposed to be designed and perhaps tested. Uh, and that's why I'm going to do this with dash lines. because these documents will either be derived from or part of uh, the hardware and software specs. So as we said, this is gonna tell you what's required. It's not gonna tell you how to do it. Um, the software spec is going to state what capabilities you may have to have, what kind of timing you may have to have, etc. It's not going to tell you 
uh, okay, you need to have these subroutines and this kind of main program. That's for the designer to figure out based on what the requirements are. talk now about the test stuff. Uh, for test spec, there are two broad classifications on testing. One is functional testing. That will specify what kind of test do I actually have to run to verify that this system was designed correctly. Um, the other broad classification for test spec Our environmental tests. Now the functional tests, we're going to be talking about functional tests uh, shortly, uh, a little bit later in today's lecture. Uh, but I want to talk a little bit about the environmental test. The environmental tests depend on what the intended use of the system is, which of course is going to be defined up here in the system spec. So when I'm talking about environmental tests, here's some of the things I may have to worry about. Temperature. Humidity. may not be much of a factor if we're building a personal computer that's going to be used in an office environment. But what if this microprocessor-based system is going to be operating in some of the jungles in Thailand? Well, now temperature, specifically high temperature, and humidity are an issue. If this is supposed to operate, say, at a research laboratory, perhaps outside in Antarctica, high temperature is an issue, humidity probably is not. Again, system specs will tell what is the operational environment that you're going to have to contend with on the product. So what this means is when I have got my system built, got my prototype, I need to run, obviously, functional testing, which we're going to talk about shortly. But I may have to also run environmental testing. Uh, radiation testing. Under radiation testing, you may have to worry about emission and absorption. Now, is that an S or T? Absorption. Yes. It's for it's A B S O R P T I O M S. Oh, okay. Absorption. English right. Um. Let's talk. About, uh, okay. I have an electric wire, and I'm sending some current through it, and that's going to cause electromagnetic radiation around that particular wire. If you have kitchen appliances, for example, you will see quite often on the back some sort of label that says this complies with FCC Part 15 requirements for radiation. Um, that would be an example of emission 
you would actually put this thing in some sort of anechoic chamber and measure what kind of frequencies are being emitted and what the intensity is. Now, as far as absorption is uh, required, uh, that may be nuclear. Um, years ago, when I was working for the Eldec Corporation, we built power switching amplifiers that are used on Tomahawk cruise missiles. And uh, the cruise missile may have to operate in a nuclear battlefield environment. It turns out that circuitry, op amps, transistors, and so forth, change behavioral characteristics when they're subjected to nuclear radiation. So we had, and it was classified secret, the radiation intensity. We had to verify that our circuit would still perform in the given nuclear environment. So we had to do absorption testing. Vibration testing. Now, this, this PC, if this is what we're building, that's not going to be subject to much uh, vibration, so that's not really much of an issue. Uh, but what if this microprocessor based system is going to be bolted into the bed of a truck, and that truck is used in off road environments? Now you've got a lot of vibration that you're going to have to contend with you need to run vibration testing. Now the way vibration testing is actually run, they call it a shaker table, it's just a table. And you bolt your system onto the table. And then this is driven by a sinusoid and the magnitude of the sinusoid will determine how much forward and back this table moves with your system bolted onto it. And the frequency determines how fast. And of course you have three directions that you're going to have to deal with. So um, typically what you would do is you run some of your functional tests while this system is undergoing vibration to make sure you can still pass them functional test. So that's vibration. That's shock. Shock test. So my PC here, I'm probably not going <laughs> to, that I'm designing, it's not going to go from shock. But how many of you in here have dropped your smartphone Definitely. on cement okay. and it still worked? <laughs> Smartphones underwent shock testing and they literally ran a shock test like that because that's something that the system may have to contend with. So again, it depends on what your system is. The operational environment will determine which of these environmental tests uh, you're gonna have to run. Okay? Now, you're the hardware designer. In fact, you're the project engineer. That means you're going to be responsible to make sure all of those tests are run and you can pass them before it goes into production. So you may be the lead digital electronic designer. Nevertheless, you will get involved in some of these uh, environmental tests. Temperature testing. 
you literally will put the system into a commercial oven or into a commercial freezer and run functional tests to see how it acts. Humidity, same thing. You put it into a chamber, crank up the humidity, run functional tests, does it still pass? Now, every test that you run have to be matched against specifications. Chapter and verse. For every requirement identified in a specification, doesn't matter if it's in the system spec, hardware spec, or software spec, you have to have a test that indicates, will evaluate the system to see whether or not that requirement has been met. So, uh, as an example, you may have uh, on, uh, let's take a temperature test. Uh, the system Shall conduct and pass functional test three while operating. Forty-five degrees Celsius, and then I'm going to do this in parentheses. It depends on how the company wants to do that. This is a requirement in the systems back. System spec chapter three, subsection C, sub subsection six. So I can map this test to a specific requirement in here to indicate whether or not, to evaluate whether or not your design system meets that specification. So you're gonna to have to have some sort of way of mapping tests to requirements so that you can verify that that requirement has been evaluated and the system design passed. Now, I do want to bring up the issue of one of my board stories. I was working for uh, some strand data control. I was a uh, principal engineer. I was also a uh, product engineer for one of their product lines. Um, these were back in the days when you have the um, three and a half inch disc drives. And what we built was ruggedized three and a half inch disc drives for the aerospace industry, Boeing and Air, uh, Airbus. What would happen is there would be data that was collected as the plane was flying. And there were these disk drives where the maintenance personnel could then insert a disk, download the data, 
uh, that was being taken while the plane was flying so that they get some idea on how the system was performing, uh, the aircraft. So these disk drives had to be ruggedized because of shock, like when the plane lands. So you can't you just use a commercial one like you could have in an office environment. So this will be a top-down view. Here's the enclosure. Here's the disk drive. And I'm going to exaggerate this a little bit. This was bolted into this enclosure. And these were kind of rubber shock absorbers. Uh, so this thing was actually kind of almost suspended in the uh, enclosure. And these shock absorbers would dampen any vibration or shock so that they wouldn't bounce against the enclosure. Um, this disk drive had an IEEE 488 data interface. And a customer came in and they said, we'd like to buy this, but we want the SCSI interface instead of the IEEE 488. So, all this entailed was a small redesign. There were a couple of integrated circuits that had to be swapped and a little bit of redesign of the um, printed circuit board to accommodate the SCSI interfaces of the IEEE 488. So since this was a new design, I had to run vibration testing. I could not get that system to pass. No matter what I did, I could not get the system to pass vibration. Uh, the functional test that we were running is we take like a megabyte of data, write it to the disk drive, read it back, and then verify that what we wrote, what we got back. Could not get this thing to pass. Found out how to get this to pass with the 488 interface. Found out that here's what my engineering manager had done. We had an engineering technician by the name of John. So John, put those in there, run the vibration test. If it doesn't pass, put another set in there. If that doesn't pass, put another set in there. Keep going until you find a set that it passes. We'll document it. Now we can go into production. And if the customer ever asks, we have this engineering report that we can furnish them a copy. Uh, I, uh, he absolutely refused to have this designed properly. One week later, I let it go. Ethics. If you're running testing, make sure the tests are conducted properly, the results are documented properly, and if you claim that they pass specifications, they damn well better pass those specifications, or they don't have your signature on There are legal ramifications. Uh, there could be catastrophic um, ramifications. But you always want to be very ethical uh, about the jail. Yeah, I'm just sorry, I'm just curious, what are like some other examples of ethics violations that you would see in a thing? Like uh, obviously like safety issues. Well that that was an obvious one. Uh, now if they custom fit everyone that came off the production line, well that would be fine. Right. But they didn't. Right. And right. every time you replace them, you were replacing the same uh, you know, he had a drawer full of these 
rubber donuts or whatever. They just take the same type and plug them in until they got a set that passed. Right. So, all right, now, I do need to talk about one other thing, and then we'll look at functional testing. Now, you guys are all early on in your engineering education, but you need to develop the ability to speak in public. Public speaking is an absolutely essential skill that you're going to have to have. I have specifications. I ran a bunch of tests. Now, I have to prove that the design I came up with meets all of the requirements. I have to be able to prove that you picked a memory chip and you interfaced it to a microprocessor and those two chips were compatible. The timing works out. I have to prove that. How do I prove that? Design reviews. And there's two types. Preliminary and critical. There's only one critical design review. Uh, you may have one or more preliminary design reviews. Um, these preliminary design reviews um, are topic specific. So I may have a preliminary design review that discusses the power supply design. Um, I may have another um, preliminary design review that talks about data transfer rates. So these are broad topics, but they're all focused on the same thing. You're not going to have a preliminary design review where we talk about the power supply design and data transfer rates. Those are going to be separate preliminary design reviews. Now, coming out of these, there may or may not be action items. Gee, you need to go back and rerun this set of tests because we're not sure we've actually satisfied that specification. So there may be action items where people are tasked to go out and do stuff. The critical design review is one that kind of is a wrap up. In the critical design review, you make sure that any action items that came out of preliminary design reviews have all been resolved. And there are no other issues involved. Now, that, that's why there's only one of these. Now, on the preliminary design reviews, this is where you're going to have to prove your design. Now, let me go to the example of the microprocessor and the memory chip and their interface together. And we need to prove that those chips are compatible. The memory chip has timing. We've seen that in the data sheets. The microprocessor also has timing. It generates an address. It generates a read signal or a write signal. You're going to have decode logic. So there's after the address comes out from the microprocessor, there's a certain delay time before that chip enable gets asserted. So you're going to have to stand up in front of a group and go through the timing analysis that you conducted to show that your design is compatible. And there's enough slop in there, slack in there, that it will account for manufacturing just uh, differences. 
What I mean by that is, let's suppose you satisfy the setup time exactly. What happens if you get a device where the setup time, the uh, propagation delay is advanced by half a nanosecond? If you just met the timing requirement exactly, you may not be in compliance under general manufacturing terms. So you have to show that, yes, I met the requirements for timing, um, and there's enough slack in there to account for manufacturing variations in the devices that are going to go into the design. Who attends the preliminary uh, design review? Well, usually, disinterested senior engineers, not uninterested, disinterested. You're using the XYZ processor in your microprocessor-based design. He is a senior engineer from a completely different division in the company. He has no connection with the, your project whatsoever, but he has design experience with the XYZ processor. So he's been tasked to attend your preliminary design review where you start talking about the timing analysis that you conducted to make sure that the input output ports, the memory devices, and so forth, are all compatible with your microprocessor. So he is disinterested in the sense that he doesn't have any connection with your project, whether it sinks or swims, fails or doesn't fail, doesn't bother him, he's in a completely different division. But his knowledge and expertise on the use of that processor allows him to say, well, that looks good, but have you considered the following? Because in my experience, I've seen the following conditions. And you need to take care of that in your design. So that's why disinterested but senior uh, engineers will attend your preliminary design reviews. So you, as the designer, are getting up in front of a group. There might be 10 or 15 people. Depending on how critical this is, there may be the corporate vice president of operations sitting in the back. But you're going to have to get up in front of the group and discuss what you did, show slides, graphs, whatever, to show that you conducted a thorough analysis, thorough test, and that you believe the design you've come up with will work. So you're gonna to have to develop some public speaking skills somewhere along the line. Um, I don't know if there's, for those of you who may be somewhat leery of doing this, there are organizations that can help. I don't know if Portland State has this. Some of you may have heard of this. Tooth Masters. I don't know if there's a chapter here at Portland State. Uh, but this is a group who's designed to develop public speaking ability uh, among the members. And they'll assume that you come in and you're absolutely paranoid getting up in front of the group. You may be to the point where you won't even ask a question sitting in a class because you're too shy, embarrassed, whatever. And they will take you up through to where you will actually get up and give speeches on some particular topic. So uh, I don't know if there is something like that here. Uh, but if there is, and if you don't have uh, some public speaking ability, which you are going to have to develop, 
are going to participate in these. Um, that might be something worth looking into. Um, let's take a five minute break and we'll come back. We will start talking about functional testing. <laughs>